and welcome to today's lecture on Shoshank I, founder of Egypt's 22nd Dynasty. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're going to take a deep dive into Egypt's first leader with Libyan ancestry. Both the Third Intermediate Period and the Late Period in Egypt were characterized by the rise of foreign influence at the very top of Egypt's political hierarchy. And even though this may have looked like chaos to the traditional Egyptian elite, the strength and consistency exemplified by Libyan rulers such as Shoshank and Nubian rulers such as Shabaka and Taharqa demonstrated that you didn't have to be an Egyptian to be a great Egyptian pharaoh. Moreover, these rulers provide fascinating case studies for how foreigners decide to portray themselves to the Egyptian people. So, if you're looking to raid the Holy Land and pillage the Temple of Solomon, journey with me as we investigate Shoshank of the Meshwesh. Before we start talking about Shoshank I specifically, it's useful to get a little background on his ancestry and the rising influence of his people in Egypt. Shoshank I is part of a group known as the Meshwesh, an ancient group of people from Libya. Relations between Egypt and the Meshwesh didn't start out very cordial, and for much of the New Kingdom the two groups battled fiercely for land and power and resources. As the pharaoh's strong centralized rule of the 19th and 20th dynasties of the New Kingdom began to fall apart during the 21st dynasty in the Third Intermediate Period, the Meshwesh headed eastward into the Nile Delta region and began to settle there in large numbers. Now, battles between the Libyans and Egyptians started during the height of the New Kingdom. At Karnak, we see reliefs of the pharaoh Seti I doing battle with the Libyans. And Ramses the Great built a series of forts along Egypt's western frontier, signaling a rise in the threat from Libya. Ramses' successor claims victory over the Sea Peoples, as well as claiming 9,100 swords from the Meshwesh. Later in the New Kingdom, battles continued. You may recall Ramses III as the pharaoh who boasted of his defeat of the naval pirates, the Sea Peoples. He also boasts of crushing victories against the Meshwesh. After defeating them in year 11 of his reign, Ramses III displaced a portion of the population and settled them in guarded camps in Middle Egypt in an attempt to force them to assimilate with Egyptian culture. The way to get rid of the enemy was to bring them in and make them part of your own culture. As Egyptian pharaonic power declined in the Third Intermediate Period, large populations of the Meshwesh began to settle in more and more places, especially in the Nile Delta of Lower Egypt. At sites like Mendes and Sais and Busiris, the Meshwesh settled in large numbers and began to prepare the way for one of their own to rule all of Egypt. A population once settled in an Egyptian prison camp had now become the rulers of the two lands, Upper and Lower Egypt. Shoshank was a leader since birth. He was the son of Nimlot, who was the great chief of the Meshwesh. 
and his mother was daughter of the former Great Chief of the Meshwish. So he had bloodlines of local leadership on both sides of his family. Shoshank's ancestors had begun to concentrate their power at the site of Bubastis in the Nile Delta, which became a center for Libyan populations and political leadership. But being the son of the leader of the Meshwesh and the king of all Egypt are two very different things. So let's step back and think about identity and ethnicity for a minute. We want to be careful when we say that the Libyans conquered and ruled Egypt, even though the 22nd dynasty is frequently known as the Libyan dynasty. So, for instance, right, when Barack Obama became president of the U.S. in 2008, he had Kenyan ancestry, and he had, his last name was of West African origin. But we don't usually say that Africa conquered and ruled America during his presidency. We think of him as an American, right? Yeah. Okay, anyway, in the same way, Shoshank's family had lived in Egypt for generations, and it's likely that he thought of himself at least as much Egyptian as he did Libyan or Meshwesh or anything else. So how did he become Pharaoh? Well, not only was his dad the great chief of the Meshwesh, his uncle was Osorkon the Elder, one of the pharaohs of the preceding 21st dynasty. As a result of these connections, Shoshank became the military advisor of the final king of the 21st dynasty, and he used his military connections to take the throne when the previous king had died. Once taking the throne, Shoshank depicted himself like a traditional Egyptian ruler. He took an Egyptian epithet, beloved of Amun, and a fully Egyptian throne name. On the walls of the Temple of Karnak, Shoshank depicted himself like a traditional Egyptian pharaoh, and like the rest of the pharaohs, described his military victories over foreign enemies of the Near East. To consolidate power, he made one of his sons the high priest of Amun at Karnak, and his other sons commanders of his army in Upper, Middle, and Lower Egypt. Despite ruling during the Third Intermediate Period, Shoshank was a relatively strong pharaoh who ruled for more than 20 years, from 943 to 922 BCE. He was the first king of the 22nd Dynasty, and he reunited the entire country of Upper, Middle, and Lower Egypt, bucking the trend of fragmentation that occurred during other intermediate periods and his hold over Egypt and the military was strong enough that he could conduct military expeditions abroad. He focused most of these excursions on the Israel-Palestine-Syria-Lebanon area, a region often known as the Levant. As Shoshank's troops moved north, they conquered some of the most famous cities in the region. In the northern part of modern-day Israel, we get Shoshank's victory at Megiddo, Megiddo is probably best known as the location of the final battle between good and evil in the New Testament's book of Revelation. It's the term for the site Armageddon, which comes from the word Har, meaning hill or mountain, and Megiddo being the name of the city. After defeating the armies of Megiddo, Shoshank set up a stela and described a massive list of cities that he'd conquered. Shoshank's armies made it even farther north into modern-day Lebanon. And at the ancient city of Byblos, we still have a statue base with the name of Shoshank inscribed upon it. Scholars still debate whether the statue of Shoshank in Byblos represents his conquest of the city, or whether it's the result of a mutually beneficial trade relationship. Most scholars go with the latter explanation, but the issue remains unsolved. Once he returned to Egypt, Shoshank recorded his conquests in several places. On what's known as the Bubastite portal at Karnak, Shoshank shows the god Amun-Ra receiving all the cities that he conquered on his trip through the Levant. Another temple of Amun, this time at Al-Hibba in Middle Egypt, received a similar inscription detailing the conquests of Shoshank. So, with these hearty lists of foreign conquests 
It feels like Shoshank is far closer to the powerful pharaohs of Egypt's new kingdom than he is to the weaker pharaohs of various intermediate periods. While Shoshank's ability to reunify Egypt and to conduct successful military expeditions abroad make him a noteworthy pharaoh, it is his actions in the ancient regions of Israel and Judah that really make him memorable. A little background here. According to the Bible, a young man named David became king of Israel after defeating the Philistine giant Goliath. He expanded his territory using military force, and he left his kingdom to his son Solomon upon his death. King Solomon built the first temple in Jerusalem to hold the Ark of the Covenant which held the Ten Commandments and he was known for his unparalleled wisdom. Upon his death, the region split, with ten of the tribes to the north retaining the title of Israel and being led by Jeroboam, and the two tribes to the south becoming the kingdom of Judah, which contained Jerusalem, and that being led by Rehoboam. Now, our Egyptian king Shoshank plays a critical role in this narrative, because many scholars believe that he is the same person that the Hebrew Bible refers to as King Shishak. Not only do the names share etymological similarities, the dates of both Shoshank and Shishak appear to converge nicely. So we may have independent verification of at least some of the characters from the Hebrew Bible. The story of Shishak is described in the biblical books of 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. In these passages, we see Jeroboam king of the northern tribes of Israel, flee to the Egyptian Shishak. Once there, he marries the wife of the pharaoh, and together Jeroboam and Shishak lay siege to the kingdom of Judah, where Rehoboam rules. To prevent complete destruction of Jerusalem, Rehoboam gives Shishak all the gold in the city, including that of the Temple of Solomon, except for the most prized and holy possession, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, scholars still debate whether Shoshank and Shishak are indeed the same person. The biggest problem here centers on Jerusalem itself. While the stela from Megiddo and the inscriptions at Karnak list sites all around Judah and Israel, there is no mention of Jerusalem. And some say that's because Shoshank just didn't conquer it at all. But others argue that since he was like basically bought off and he didn't sack the city, that's the reason he didn't add it to the list of conquests. So, are they the same person? Well, that's up to you to decide. One of the most important actions of Shoshank I, at least from the perspective of modern Egyptologists and archaeologists, had nothing to do with temples or conquests or any of the normal stuff pharaohs are known for. Instead, it had to deal with burial practices, or more accurately, reburial practices. During the 21st dynasty, the pharaohs began to inspect the tombs of the great rulers of the new kingdom. And it became evident that already, even back then, even in antiquity, many of the tombs had been robbed. And the mummies and coffins of the pharaohs had been disturbed and in some cases desecrated. To remedy this, the Third Intermediate Period pharaohs began to move the New Kingdom mummies out of their original tombs in the Valley of the Kings and into a new tomb, that of Pinejem II, the High Priest of Amun, which was built high into the cliffs at Deir el-Bahri, the same site that Hatshepsut's famous mortuary temple existed at. Moving the mummies began with Shoshank's predecessor and continued in large part during his reign. These mummies were discovered at Deir el Bahri in 1881. As the story goes, a goat of a local tomb raider fell down a shaft. The owner followed it down to discover the cache of royal mummies, and after realizing he could never sell all of this on the black market without getting discovered and arrested, he gave up the location of the tomb to the Egyptian Antiquities Service. In all, more than 50 royal mummies kings and queens and the rest of the royal family were found reburied in this tomb. 
These include some of the most important pharaohs in Egyptian history. We get second Enre Tao, who led the revolt against the Hyksos and got a battle axe to the head for his trouble. We get Seti I, who built the massive temple at Abydos. We get Ramses the Great, perhaps the greatest conqueror and builder New Kingdom Egypt had ever seen. And we get Ramses III, bold defender of Egypt against the Sea Peoples. Personally, I can like hardly imagine encountering such a find, right? 50 of the greatest rulers of Egypt in the flesh, or at least kind of, you know, what's left of it, wrapped in their bandages and sitting in their coffins. Truly one of the greatest archaeological finds in all of Egypt. And we can thank Shoshank for keeping them safe through the ages. Shoshank I, founder of Egypt's 22nd dynasty, provides an excellent case study into the identity of kingship during the Third Intermediate Period in Egypt. Even though he comes from a long line of Libyans, he acts and portrays himself like a traditional Egyptian king of the New Kingdom. Not only that, he's able to garner the power of a New Kingdom king as well, reuniting Egypt and sending out successful military expeditions into the Holy Land, and perhaps being recorded in the Bible itself as the fearsome pharaoh Shishak. They say you can't judge a book by its cover, and perhaps you can't judge a pharaoh by his name. Shoshank was of Libyan ancestry, but he was an Egyptian king nonetheless. Just a couple lessons you can learn from Shoshank of the Meshwesh.